Welcome to Dynasty Life. I am Theo Greminger. Redraft ends, but Dynasty is life. And Dynasty Life, I, I guess I've put out a, a number of shows at this point because I'm starting to get repeat guests. And Heath Cummings, my guest today, was one of my first guests on Dynasty Life. Uh, helped get this thing started. Big hat tip to Heath uh, uh, for all the work he puts into the Dynasty community. Uh, if you're not following Heath, Heath is uh, is putting out tremendous content over at CBS Sports. He is the host of Fantasy Football Today Dynasty. Uh, it's a, a must-listen-to show for me every week. Uh, and Heath, you've been having some great guests on. Your guest last week, incredible. Um, but other than that, like you know, let everybody know where they can find you, what you're putting out. It's a great time of year for us, Heath. Absolutely. And you did a fine job there. I'm not sure I have to say much. Thank you for the kind words. I always enjoy talking to you. You won't have a hard time getting me to come on this podcast. Uh, yeah, you can find everything over at CBS Sports. Um, we actually have our now a dynasty landing page. We have enough content to where we're going to house it all in one place. So if you go to the fantasy football page at CBS Sports and you look in the top right hand corner, there should be something that says Dynasty Central, Dynasty Landing Page. We've got rankings, we've got tiers, we've got trade charts, we've got mailbags, we've got podcasts. We've got just just about everything you could want for Dynasty Fantasy Football. Yeah, and I think it's pretty indicative of of how big Dynasty is getting uh, for for CBS to be making like that sort of push. I know this has been a big passion of yours. There were years and years where people only associated you with sort of redraft content, uh, but you know this has been uh, you know big hat tip to you for for getting you know this ball rolling. It's great to see sort of the larger sites really embracing Dynasty. Do you see it it growing the same way I do, Heath? I, I certainly hope so. Listen, I just actually started, it's funny, on, on the opposite end of the spectrum. When I was hired at CBS, the, the main purpose was because they were launching a new show with this new company called FanDuel, and they were going to do something called Daily Fantasy Sports, and I was going to do a show based on that. And this is, I think, Dynasty probably could not be further from that. But that, that's the thing that I love about this aspect of fantasy football is this is the thing that keeps groups of guys together for 20, 25. I love it when we get an email from somebody who's been, so I've been playing on CBS with the same group of guys for 25 years. That's the best part about fantasy football is like this, this game that keeps people together. Now, listen, I love DFS. I, I love the best ball tournaments and this, like all that stuff's great. And I love anything that grows fantasy football. But the, the thing that's near and dear to my heart is that like, that 12 team league that you've been with the same 10 or 11 guys for the last 20 years. And you've got your records of who's won all the leagues and all that stuff. And I just hope that that continues to grow. Yeah. I love, I love the idea of these long-term leagues and I know I'm in a few of them. They can be sometimes the most frustrating <laughs> uh, or, yes. or, or, or your, your, your happiest leagues to have to deal with depending on, on your seasonal situation. Uh, I know for me, you also get the, the tremendous like league chats you know, yes. you're you're in. I'm in certain leagues where it's like I don't know anybody. You kind of know people from being in the league, and then there's other leagues where you're you're involved with like a lot of friends. So it's I, I agree. Dynasty kind of lends itself to that nature where you're not looking at such a short term aspect of fantasy like we get in redraft. Redraft leagues are fun, and people do long long term redraft leagues. But in those sort of leagues, there's a lot less pressure on you to make very very strong personnel decisions because you only have to live with it for, for half of a year, if that. Uh, with us in Dynasty, Heath, like a bad rookie pick can can haunt you for for five years. you got to see it in your opponent. I, I, am, see, I, I am seeing Corey Davis in, in, my, in my vision. I, I'll never shake that one. Um, but no, the, the flip side of that is like the, the good picks are just so much fun. And so, yeah, I, I, the thing I, I love that aspect of – you get the email that you have a trade offer and you see who it's from. And no matter which member of your league it's from, like you instantly know, oh, it's this guy. <laughs> I, know, I know what this trade's going to be all like. So yeah, it's 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 a fantastic thing. Every single Dynasty League, I think it's a rule that there's one person you don't like opening up their offers. There's certain people that can literally get you angry with with some offer. I know I got one today, somebody trying to sell me Jerry Judy. And I'm like, what are we, what are we doing here? What yeah. are we doing here? You know, I'm never going to get those five minutes back, Heath, though. So, so <laughs> I want to dive into, you know, this was this is a we're going to talk about our buy lows. And this is a great time of year to trade because you have so many uh, you know, dynasty managers who maybe take a little bit of time off after the Super Bowl and then come back into the woodwork that you have the news from the combine, then we have this incredible news from free agency. Uh, leading up to our rookie draft. So it starts to be a little bit more active period. You also see a lot of times 
new uh, managers in these dynasty leagues. Orphans have usually been sold or or just given away at this point. And a lot of times these new managers get a, a full-on orphan roster and they're yes. looking to make some deals, you know, one way or another, rebuild or go for it right away. But we would be remiss if we didn't spend a little time on this incredible NFL free agency period. And one interesting question, when I came on your pod last week, we were ecstatic about some of the running back performances at the NFL Combine. We see saw players like Trey Benson, uh, like Jalen Wright, like Marshawn Lloyd, like Blake Corum, do things to seemingly improve their NFL draft stock. Then we saw a slew of teams not only sign uh, free agent running backs, but signed free agent running backs within like the first six hours of free agency. So they had a plan and they executed it. A lot of our seemingly like perfect landing spots, spots where these rookies can walk right into a high volume role, the door seems to have closed a little bit. Do you think that the NFL action with these running backs was indicative of how they view this 2024 rookie running back class? Or do you think it was something else? I, I think it could be a little bit that I think we have to also remember like going when we talked last week, we were talking about the fact that we've never had a time where there were 10, 12 former starter starting running backs, like all available at once. And only a couple of them outside of their prime, most of them in that 25 to 27 year old age range. So there were a bunch of them. And then if you look at the other skill positions, I wouldn't be surprised if some teams kind of felt like, well, there's not much there at wide receiver that I want. There's not much there at tight end that I want. I wasn't really a left tackle out there that anybody seems super excited about. And then we get this huge hike in the salary cap kind of coinciding with that. So yeah, I think I, I'm maybe a little bit more optimistic about this running back class than the way I hear everybody else talking about it. So I don't think this means that they just hate the running backs in this class. I think it was really a storm of, of several different events that caused the running backs to go off quickly. But I was surprised. I figured with so many on the market, the teams would kind of use that to negotiate against each other. And they just flew off the board so quick, they didn't have that chance. It was a cascade effect. Yeah. And I think the craziest thing was, Aaron Jones cut Aaron Jones signed within like, you know, a, a few hours. It was, it was incredible. It's like these teams all had sort of contingency plans uh, and kind of read the room uh, correctly. Minnesota getting a, I mean, Minnesota cutting Alexander Madison and then replacing him essentially with Aaron Jones uh, in a short period of time is wild. It, but one player that I think we're going to talk about uh, who we think are the biggest winners here dynasty wise. And certainly there was some, higher profile players to sign. But I found it interesting that the first domino to fall, the one of the first players signed in all of free agency was DeAndre Swift. This is a guy who had a thousand yard rushing season for Philadelphia last year, saw his targets dip to a historical low for him for his career. Philly didn't really utilize him as a pass catcher like we saw in his seasons in Detroit. Now he lands on a Chicago offense that we think could be much improved next year with potentially Caleb Williams and a few other skill position players added through the draft. What does this do for you with DeAndre Swift, Heath? Because I think he's a hard player for some uh, dynasty managers to value right now. Is he just fall into the, like the sea of RB2s? Or do you see this as a, hey, maybe we're going to get back to DeAndre Swift Detroit time? I, I think he's definitely been one of the hardest players for the dynasty community to value. I'd love to see one of those charts of where his ranking at running back has been over the last two years. Because this is a guy who was a consensus top five dynasty running back at one point and then fell all the way outside of the top 20. And now I think he's probably just barely inside of that top 20. I, I think one of the harder things to evaluate about Swift, and we have several players like this in the league, is it does seem like fantasy football managers have liked DeAndre Swift more than his head coach generally has. And now the Bears obviously have, are very interested in him. I'm not sure if that's the, the right stage of their uh, rebuilding plan to be making an investment in a running back like that. But we still have questions. How much is Caleb Williams really going to throw to his running back? We've not seen Shane Waldron's offense do that a lot over the past three seasons. Um, so low end number two running back, maybe right around a RB 18 to 20 in dynasty for me, but still young enough to where if I'm wrong about that, if, if he really is a true workhorse in Chicago, that man, he, he could vault up into the top 12 pretty early in the 2024 season. 
And a, a comment in the chat, another criticism here is some people mm-hmm. are seeing this as a, hey, Khalil Herbert's still there. Roshan Johnson is still there. Anthony in the chat says the backfield split makes it tough on Swift. I, I see this as you don't even think about Herbert and Johnson in your evaluation of Swift based on what Chicago paid him and how early on in the process they did it. If they had a lot of confidence in, Her- confidence in Herbert or or in Roshan Johnson, I don't know if they are this aggressive. They could have signed a cheaper running back if they were looking for some three-way split. How are you seeing that one, Heath? I, yeah, I think maybe and this is I always tell people like, don't ever say this guy burnt me last year. And so I'm not going to invest in him this year. I'm not saying that, but I did make a similar argument about investment and how much the new team liked Miles Sanders. And that didn't work out very well. So I'm feeling a little bit hesitant to make the same comparison with another back who's leaving the Philadelphia Eagles and going to maybe a bad team. Um, but yeah, I, I think pure talent wise. Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson should not matter to DeAndre Swift. It's just that I don't think pure talent wise, Jamal Williams and Kenny Gainwell should matter to DeAndre Swift, but they kind of have. Yeah, it, it's definitely a, a weird, weird player to value right now. Uh, it, I'm sure like yourself, people hear you on a podcast that you play leagues with. And I was very positive about the Swift news. So I've mm-hmm. been like sent a bunch of trade offers for <laughs> Swift for like rookie picks. And I, I just can't. I can't pull the trigger at this point. It's not something where I want to, I, I like it for Swift. I like it for the bears, but I, I think they paid him a little too much, but I, I do like it for the bears stylistically. But for me, it's like, I, I don't know. Am I, am I willing to trade this pick for Swift? I'm not quite there yet. So uh, definitely an interesting one. I think for me, if one of the players gets boxed out, it's going to be Khalil Herbert yeah. because I think he has some value on the trade market. And, you know, we see another comment in the, ch- in the chat from Matt, about how Johnson's the one who can pass protect. I think Roshan Johnson is more like-for-like replacement for DeAndre Swift, whereas Khalil Herbert's not a guy you would target, not a guy you would use in like the screen game. Uh, You know, specifically, he's more of a a true running back, whereas Roshan is a little more of a two-way back like Swift is on paper. Just my my gut feeling. Uh, Two backfields that I think people can't get a hold of right now. Tennessee. We were very disappointed for Ty J Spears. Tony Pollard signs with with the Titans. Spears had steamed up to like RB17 on underdog. This is a guy that some dynasty managers were going nuts for. A guy that he was appeared in every single like tr- trade for uh, article out there. He was certainly a guy that I was bullish on. Thankfully, I didn't trade a fortune for, for Tajay Spears or acquire any of them this offseason because he's a lot cheaper today, Heath. They not only sign a Derrick Henry replacement in Tony Pollard, but they sign a running back who sort of caps Ty J Spears' target ceiling. And that was the best thing about Ty J Spears was he had 50 plus receptions as a rookie. We were looking for him to take a step forward in year two. How are you reading that backfield? Is this a, I'm not interested in either one. Is this a, hey, I'm going to look to buy Ty J Spears for a little less than it would have cost me a couple of days ago? Yeah, I, I think, first off, there's some poetic justice here. I mean, we spent, what, three years just clamoring for Tony Pollard to get more touches, and his, his upside was capped by a 27- or 28-year-old running back. And now the Titans go sign a 27-year-old Tony Pollard to cap J Spears' upside. Um, I'm more interested in buying Spears than I am Pollard. I think the nice yeah. thing for Spears is that Pollard's not young. Pollard's not he has one season as a full feature back, and the first half of that season wasn't very productive. And so there's still some outs here for Spears to just be the more efficient back and earn more touches as the season goes on. Um, I definitely agree with you. Like it, Buying Ty J Spears before this news was just about impossible and a bad choice probably because he was so steamed up. Now some of that comes off. I'm more interested in seeing how what it costs. Like how, how early in round two, in terms of rookie draft picks, do I have to pay for Ty J Spears? Yeah, and I think I've seen a, a you know, a, an unknown where it's going to land. You know, flat out 2025 20, second round pick for Ty J be accepted. I think that's a price. I think I'd be willing to pay for him. Yes, I think I'd want a little bit more if I was going to sell Ty J Spears just because we believe in the talent. And the devil's advocate to my argument is he played with a much better running back last year in Derrick Henry, and he still produced. Right. Uh, so, you know, like you said, Pollard, way smaller sample size, way less durable, I mean, perceived durability 
Uh, we've already seen him get hurt in a, you know, last year towards the end of the year. So who knows? One other backfield that people can't seem to, to grasp right now is Cincinnati. Uh, Chase Brown is an enticing player. A lot of speed, showed some receiving ability last year in a small sample size. And now Zach Moss, who had a very quiet start to his NFL career in Buffalo, sort of bounced around, gets to Indianapolis last year, and has this really strong first half of the season where he was a RB1 for a good portion of it. Uh, then Jonathan Taylor comes back, he gets phased out a little bit. But the market was into Zach Moss. D apparently Dallas tried to sign him, and it ends up being the Cincinnati Bengals. Which running back would you be more interested in rostering for your dynasty teams, Heath? Chase Brown or Zach Moss? First off, for Zach Moss's case, I wish the Cowboys had signed him because I do think that he's going to find it's not quite as easy to find rushing lanes on the Cincinnati Bengals as it was on the on the Indianapolis Colts last year. Um, I definitely it would be Chase Brown for me. I'm skeptical that either of these guys are really going to move the needle all that much. In turn, I don't think Brown probably ever has the upside to be a true like 15 plus touches per game guy. And I think that he, but I, but I do think he's certainly going to have a role. So I kind of view both as high end flexes, um, but Brown is obviously cheaper. So I would prefer to have him on my roster. I'm with you. I'm on, I'm on Brown. And the thing about Moss is we haven't ever seen him catch more than 27 passes right. in the season. So I do think he's in that thumper role, that goal line role, that could be valuable in an offense like Cincinnati that we think is going to be an upper half offense. But with Tyler Boyd, Boyd gone, with the change at tight end, there's there's room for a running back to be targeted and be part of the passing game on, on a weekly basis. And I think that's Chase Brown. And he's a high-value touch guy uh, with that sort of speed. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and send out some offers for Chase Brown this week when the market kind of can't figure things out. What about the notion that they're going to draft somebody where I saw an argument on Twitter wh where two analysts that I respect, one said, this is just a stopgap. The other's like, no, this is what Cincinnati's doing. Uh, this is going to be Chase Brown with Travian Williams as, as RB3 and Zach Moss. Where Do you think this is a what we're looking at for 2024 backfield here, Heath? I think it probably depends on like uh, which of these running backs fall to day three. I'd be surprised if the Bengals are adding somebody the first two days of the NFL draft, but they could add a day three back. And none of the backs on their roster are certainties to beat out a day three back if it's the right guy and if he has a really good camp and a really good start to the season. So I, I'd be interested in that in a low cost, like third or fourth round rookie pick, like get that guy on my roster and let's see if he can go go beat out somebody. But for the most part, I think for this year, they're going the, the cheaper running back path. All right. So we've talked about a couple of these, you know, confusing situations. Now let's talk about the really big winners. For you, which player moves and gains the most dynasty value based on a free agent uh, landing spot? Well, I guess that depends. Do you do you want a guy who'd actually change teams or just a guy who benefits from a guy changing teams? I like where your head's at, and I'm guessing <laughs> that he his last name is a city in Europe. It's like it's not original at all, but it's definitely Drake London, and we get a chance to see if Drake London can be the number one dynasty wide receiver that we all think that he can be. Uh, enormous upgrade getting Kirk Cousins. It sounds like the coaching staffs made it clear they think the passing game should run through Drake London. I think Darnell Mooney helps in clearing out space for London to work. I love everything about this situation. You just hope that Cousins, by the time we get to September, is Kirk Cousins again. And if that's the case, it's wheels up for Drake London as potentially a league-winning wide receiver. I love it. And I think that that Drake London, we have to keep reminding ourselves, is 22 years old. Right. He's younger than a lot of the wide receivers we discussed on on your pod that are that are available in this draft class. Like we're talking about like Ricky Persall and Xavier Leggett being drafted in the second round of the NFL draft. Both of those guys are older than Drake London right now. Uh, it's wild. He's got a chance to to have 150 targets. He has a chance to be the focal point. And Heath, I, I'm glad you brought up Darnell Mooney because that's also like, you know, no disrespect to Darnell Mooney, but that's a, a bullet dodged because I think that Atlanta, the way that they're building their team, if one of those elite wide receivers was available to them at eight overall and they didn't sign somebody in this free agent class, like we don't have to worry about a 
wide receiver sapping targets from from London. Mooney's going to be a whole different different kind of player, uh, and certainly not his talent profile. So the 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 writing is on the wall there. Your quick thoughts on Josh Jacobs or and Saquon Barkley? Those for me, I would say, are the two big dynasty winners. Saquon, uh, of course, goes to maybe the best offense he's ever played in. Uh, of course, his target ceiling is a little bit capped with a quarterback that doesn't really hasn't shown a history of checking down to the running back. Um, and we could say also could potentially vulture a few touchdowns, but just based on the quality of the offense, going from New York, this sort of train wreck to Philadelphia, Saquon for me, certainly his two year window is, is way better than it was a, a couple of weeks ago. And then Josh Jacobs, I love Jacobs going to a team with so many young players where he can be the focal point. He gets a chance to play next to Jordan Love, a quarterback who I'm, oh, I think is talented, as opposed to you know Gardner Minshew as sort of a, a bridge quarterback in Las Vegas. I think those two guys for me are, are big winners. Your thoughts on those two? Yeah, I, I've been a Jacobs over Saquon guy um, for about the last year or so, and Jacobs str- certainly struggled last year. But I'm going to stay a Jacobs over Saquon guy, and you you kind of hit on one of the reasons, like. I, I do think that there's probably more target upside for Jacobs playing with Jordan Love than there is playing with Jalen Hurts. And there's certainly more touchdown upside for Jacobs with now Jalen Hurts scoring 10 to 15 rushing touchdowns per season. Now, I still think Saquon, these are these two are the clear best running backs moving forward from the, all the guys who change teams. Um, I would just, I'd put Jacobs inside my top 12. Saquon would be just outside of my top 12. I'm, I'm a little bit more concerned about Saquon's age. What's it, another year and a half older than, than Jacobs. So maybe a little more likely to go off the cliff in the next two years than Jacobs is. The nice thing for Saquon is he's, he's going to be in Philly for two years. Jacobs contracts kind of strange. It's possible that they just pay him $15 million for a year and then let him go. Um, but yeah, but both these guys, the clear two top running backs who change teams, I would lean towards Jacobs. The 109 in Superflex mm-hmm. or Josh Jacobs? Jacobs. I think I'm there with you. I think that I would take him in a situation in Green Bay over any running back in this draft class. And I think that, like we talked about all the positives there, I think that that's a good price. I would not trade the 107. That's sort of my cutoff for Superflex. Uh, when we start diving into tiers, but 108, 109, 110, I think we're right in that wheelhouse. I'm gonna we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, we're gonna dive into a few rookies, and we're gonna get uh, Heath and Heath and my dynasty buy low trade targets. A few players that you can go make trades for right now that can improve your dynasty rosters. This episode is brought to you by Player Profiler, the Dynasty Deluxe Package. The rankings are the best in the industry. It includes strategy mode where you can say, hey, change the rankings to be win now. Oh, change the rankings to be productive struggle. There's also a draft planner to help to strategize where you should take players because the draft planner also includes ADP. There's a trade finder where we look up on my fantasy league and we see trades that are done, including a particular player. Then there's a trade analyzer where you can plug in draft picks, players, and we assign a lifetime value to draft picks out five years. The best thing about our trade analyzer, it can't be gamed with volume. And there's mock draft data to see right now what's the market for player X versus player Y, including in the fall when very few mock drafts are happening. And our Dynasty Guide, the Dynasty Dominator would cost you 10 bucks on Amazon, but you get it for free with Dynasty Deluxe and you get our Rookie Guide for free, a $25 value. So you get all of that for 45 bucks. I mean, it's a great deal. Welcome back to Dynasty Life. I'm Theo Greminger, joined by Heath Cummings of CBS. And Heath, we could talk free agency like th- this whole this whole show, but we want to dive into a bunch of other topics. If you want to uh, hear a little bit more about this free agency class, uh, I recorded with Alan Soslowski yesterday on press coverage. It's right here on Player Profiler YouTube. Check it out and dropping as a podcast, I believe, this afternoon. But Heath, I want to dive into this rookie class a little bit. We're starting to see uh, the Vegas odds on, you know, where guys should land, sort of the the markets are, are definitely moving. And I wanted to get a chance to talk to you about one player that it looks like he's going to be the 102 in the NFL draft. 
However, every time I'm seeing super flex uh, rookie mock drafts, I'm seeing Jaden Daniels sometimes landing as the 104 or the 105. Could this end up being just an incredible value for dynasty managers based on the potential he has in fantasy, certainly with his rushing upside and also his underrated uh, decision-making in the pocket where Jaden Daniels last year for LSU passes for over 40 touchdowns with very few interceptions. I I think that maybe the market's a little low on Daniels. I I certainly think that it is. And I wonder if it's just the stage we're at where right now we're focusing on all the things that he hasn't done. He doesn't throw over the middle and the intermediate enough. He he doesn't have a long enough track record of good production as a passer. And he was too old. And I, I, I really think that's overthinking it when you have a guy with such a specialized skill set like him that put what he put on tape last season. I have a hard time believing he won't either be the 102 or the 103 either way. I don't really care. As long as he's a top three pick, he should be the second pick in super flex rookie only drafts, I would say. And I do think that he has a better chance than people are giving him credit for being the most valuable quarterback for fantasy football purposes in this class. I wish that he'd be a little bit more careful when he was rushing, but his oh, yeah. that, that that combination of his elite athleticism as a rusher and his, his ability to throw the ball down the field, that's very, very difficult for opposing defenses to stop. And, I, and I'll say this about the when we get to wide receiver as well, but one of the things I love about Daniels is it's, it's such a specific skill set, and it's so o- obvious what he's awesome at that I don't think there's very much risk of somebody drafting him and then trying to make him do something that he's not. The type of team that's going to use the second or third pick on Jaden Daniels is going to know exactly what he is, and they're going to emphasize his strengths. And I think as long as a team does that, he's going to be a fantasy star. So I'm seeing him up to like minus 150 on certain books to be the second player uh, selected in the NFL draft. That's almost assuredly, unless they can move up to one, going to be the Washington Commanders. We know that it's Dan Quinn as the head coach, and we know it's Cliff Kingsbury as the offensive coordinator. Uh, They have a couple of, you know, pretty interesting players. They added Austin Eckler to go with Brian Robinson. Uh, They still have Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, who was disappointing last year, but was a first round pick. And they have several draft picks. I believe they have two second round picks. So how do you feel about the fit of Jaden Daniels not only as the prospect, but him landing in Washington. I love it. If like assuming Cliff Kingsbury is on board, and listen, I didn't love everything that he did in Arizona, but I do think he'll design an, an offense that takes advantage of Daniel's skill set. And I love the combination of Terry McCorn. I'm not over Jahan Dotson yet. Austin Eckler, the only place he really adds value at this stage of the career is helping a young quarterback. Now, I don't think Jaden Daniels is necessarily good for Austin Eckler. I don't really want to roster Austin Eckler at this stage of his career, but I do think Eckler could help Daniels out early in his career. Yeah, it's uh, definitely uh, de- definitely uh, not the worst landing spot. And I like how you bring up Kingsbury as it's it's not like the the guy that we would choose to to, to hand a young quarterback to if we could pick any of them. But at the end of the day, there were certain things that he did in Arizona in terms of pace of play, yep. in terms of you know just being open as an offense. He sort of had a little bit of a weird archetype for tiny wide receivers. But other than that, like Kingsbury will be fine. I think he'll be able to get a lot out of a – you know we saw how he did with a quarterback with scrambling ability like Kyler Murray. I, I think that we're going to see the same thing with, with Jaden Daniels. Definitely an interesting one. Uh, quickly, is there any uh, – one question in the chat. Why is everybody writing off AOC? I guess we talked about Gardner Minshew briefly. Do you see this as this is Gardner Minshew's job in Vegas, uh, or is this a a competition, Heath? Yeah, I listen. You're not going to find a bigger Gardner Minshew fan probably than than me. So I I mostly see it as it's Gardner Minshew's job, but. I don't think either of these quarterbacks are going to have a tight grip on the job. And even as much as I like Gardner Minshew, I think Antonio Pierce has made it pretty clear what he wants to do. And their first free agent signing made that clear as well. They're going to try to go play great, great defense and not mess things up on offense. So I I wouldn't be super excited about either one of these guys except for deep super flex leagues. But Minshew, I do expect to win the job and keep the job. A lot of very nervous Zamir White dynasty managers on at NFL Draft Weekend, Heath. That's a yes. <laughs> guy where you're just going to be holding your breath. 
you know, for, throughout all of day two, and, and then through holding your breath through the whole whole opening fourth round as well. And I and I think like I we were having this conversation on Twitter yesterday with some guys and like trying to sell Zamir White right now, which makes perfect sense to me. Like to take advantage of this window where Josh Jacobs is gone and the and the rookie's not there yet, but I have not seen much of a market yet. So I, I have a, a fourteen team. Uh, dynasty roster that had Khalil Herbert and Zamir White as my RB3 and my RB4. So I'm hoping that I, I lost one, but I gained the other. Back to the rookies. We we bring up Jaden Daniels, and I think a lot of the reason we're seeing some of these mock drafts where Jaden Daniels is going off the board as the 104 or the 105, and certainly the reason that we're also seeing Drake May getting pushed down uh, and J.J. McCarthy oftentimes being the, the 108 in these Superflex uh, mock drafts is because of the quality of this wide receiver class. Marvin Harrison Jr. has been ranked extremely high, highly in initial dynasty rankings on almost every site. I know for us at Player Profiler, we have Marvin Harrison Jr. as our wide receiver five. I uh, highly recommend you checking out the rest of our dynasty rankings, but we pushed him up. Malik Neighbors also is a wide receiver one for us in Dynasty. Should Rome Adunze also be there, Heath? And we'll, we'll bring up Neighbors as well. Sort of how you're viewing those two players, because I think the market was always on Marvin Harrison Jr., but now I think the market's sort of moving where if I want access to Adunze or I want access to Neighbors, I better be prepared to pay an absolute king's ransom because those guys are shooting up not only NFL draft boards, but the dynasty enthusiasm around them is insane. Yeah, I, I haven't placed these guys in my dynasty rankings yet, but I'm looking at Harrison probably around the wide receiver five to eight range. I would guess eight's probably about where he's going to fall in. Neighbors and Adunze, I'm I'm more likely to have as high end wide receiver twos, but there's just I don't want that to sound like I'm down on them at all. I think they're fantastic. It's just we've had year after year after year of of great wide receiver classes, and so there are. 12 to 15, maybe even 18 for some people, wide receiver ones. And, and they're definitely a part of that group. But I would expect they're like, we'll see who their quarterback is and what offensive system they and what type of competition they have. But best case scenario, they're probably in the 10 to 12 range. More likely, they're probably around 15. I think that's fair. And I think that we're at a, a point where there's so much quality at the wide receiver position yeah. and almost and a lot of youth that's producing at a very high level. But I will I will call you out on this one, Heath. There's no way you're putting Marvin Harrison Jr. at at wide receiver eight. I'll, I'll go I'll go head to head here. Marvin Harrison Jr. or Puka Nakua, straight up. If you're in a single QB league and you have the 101, and I offer you Puka Nakua, you're gonna are you taking that for for Marvin Harrison Jr. Because I'm absolutely not. Yeah, that's and that is my wide receiver five. Um, so probably not assuming he lands at one Oh four with Kyler. Okay. And I'll go, I'll go another step forward. AJ Brown. Cause no, I'm not. Taking that. Okay. So you're not taking Puka. You're not taking AJ Garrett Wilson. Who's up there in the dynasty rankings. And now this well. is making me think I might have Garrett Wilson too low. Cause he, I have more hesitant. I definitely have more hesitation about Garrett Wilson than I do AJ Brown. Okay. So like, I think it's, it's uh, interesting to me because I can't put, put Marvin Harrison jr. Past the big three. I think that would be right. like, nutty and then i'm on ross st brown i what he's done on the field right i can't i can't put emma marvin harrison jr ahead of him but for me that's it after that i'm, I'm taking marvin harrison jr over the rest now, of them so are you just assuming it's arizona because there was a, a, a nightmare in the chat okay so uh <laughs> shout out to gavin in the chat bringing up the the 103 with new england so i've i've tried to take a, a glass half full here the glass half full with a New England landing spot is they have nothing there. This is a spot where Marvin Harrison Jr. could be targeted 155 times as a rookie. And he's the sort of player that I don't, don't think needs 150 targets to produce for us at like this incredible level. I think he's a guy that could get a, a get away with 140, uh, be that sort of level guy. So 150, 160 targets on a bad offense I can I can paint myself a picture, but sure, sure, Gavin, I I wouldn't be that excited about that one <laughs> compared to like Arizona or the Los Angeles Chargers with Herbert. Um, but I'm not I'm not giving up on on the the player or devaluing him because of the ugly landing spot. I'm of the opinion that the the offense that he lands in will revolve around him and be built around him. 
uh, based on the draft capital that that they're going to spend on him. Yeah, I, th- I think that's probably true. I just think, like, we've been waiting two years now for Garrett Wilson and for Drake London. And so it's, it's and Wilson, they've, Wilson's been good, but not where we're ranking him. And so I would hate to see Harrison go to New England or somewhere like that, where we just have to say, yeah, we're going to rank him as a top 12 wide receiver in Dynasty based on what we believe he's going to be whenever they find a quarterback. And a shout out to Applied Literature in the chat, like a veteran like Jacoby Brissett, if they pass on quarterback in this draft class and they 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 draft Marvin Harrison Jr., yeah, I think Jacoby Brissett's going to take a look over at uh, Kendrick Bourne and Hunter Henry and Antonio Gibson and Ramondre Stevenson and say I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to target the ro- the rookie a little bit a little bit more guys I've 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 been around the block a few times um want to dive into one wide receiver that is a little bit under the radar Heath we have possibly 17 wide receivers selected by the end of round three so it's incredibly deep class but one player that did not test at the combine but has sort of a a, a lot of buzz heading into his pro day is Malik Corley. Uh, Malik Corley, if you're not uh, familiar with him, this is a player who played at Western Kentucky, uh, was a yak king, uh, led the co- the country in yak one season. Uh, he's a player that had a kind of a low A dot, uh, but a ton of production. Basically, the Western Kentucky offense revolves around getting Malik Corley near the ball, near the, the ball, near the line of scrimmage, and he would just go. Uh, he had a very successful game against Ohio State, and every time they played larger schools, he sort of produced. And they just released a like a a, a video, excuse me, pictures of his progress in like the weight room. Malik Corley looks like David Boston right now. He is <laughs> rocked up right now. So why don't you talk about your enthusiasm for Corley and why he should be on our fantasy radars, Heath? If there was ever a guy who deserved. A Debo Samuel comp. This is the guy who deserves the Debo Samuel comp all the way down to the negative a dot. <laughs> like this is the guy who you don't have to throw it down the field to him because he'll pick up 10 to 15 yards on his own. And it's this kind of the same thing that I said about Jaden Daniels. I don't think that somebody's going to draft Corley and then try to fit him into regular wide receiver role. I think people will look at him, especially from the small school what his talent skill is or set is, and they're going to put him into a a place where he's going to find success. Obviously, it would be fantastic if he was in a situation like Rasheed Rice found himself in this year. Probably won't be quite that good, but would absolutely love to see him in a place with an accurate short area passer where they're going to create space. They have somebody already that can open up downfield and then just let him do work because he could be one. Like he's not going to be Debo, Debo Samuel probably, but he could be one of the best yak gainers in the NFL from day one. Yeah. And I think that he doesn't have to be Debo Samuel, but I think that we saw like Curtis Samuel have a season where he was mm-hmm. used sort of in that Debo role and was very effective. Um, there was a mock draft where Daniel Jeremiah projected Malik Corley to be a second round pick. Not sure about that, but I do think he lands somewhere in the end of of day two. Um, And he's definitely an interesting one. Uh, It just speaks volumes to the depth of this wide receiver class that Malik Corley is sort of going under the radar here. Definitely one for, if you're not familiar with him, highly recommend you check out his highlights. A really fun player to watch. And another player who was incredibly fun to watch and a player that you're flag planting, Heath, is Jonathan Brooks. This is your RB1 in this class. Uh, this is a player that, of course, suffered a season-ending injury uh, last year at Texas. But when it comes down to it, if there was no injury, he would be by far and away the best running back prospect in this class, in my opinion. Uh, he has two-way ability. He has size. He's only 20 years old. And his numbers in terms of yards per carry in the Texas offense were almost exactly the same as Bijan Robinson's. Yeah. Uh, in the previous season. Talk about Jonathan Brooks and how you see him as a dynasty asset. I I would go so far as to say if he didn't have the ACL injury, we wouldn't have as much talk about how bad this running back class is because I actually kind of like the running. They've, They've got six guys who could all be top four or five running backs. They just don't have the the number one with a bullet. And maybe number two is not quite number two for a normal year. 
But Brooks, without the ACL injury, would be someone who I think would be in consideration as a top six rookie pick this season. And what I've kind of decided is I'm just not going to discount him that much for the ACL as long as the NFL doesn't, and I don't think they will. It happened early enough to where he legitimately could be close to 100% this season, and he doesn't even turn 21 until July. So this is an extremely young back who is the best rusher in the class, the most likely back in the class, in my opinion, to become a three down back, if we even have those anymore, um, that touches the ball 300 times over a given season. And I'm not even convinced that he's going to need a full red shirt season. It might be a, a, a Brees Hall situation where you, you pull back on him for the first four or five weeks, and then he just takes off and goes to the moon. I, he's not somebody who's going to, if he gets drafted in round two, immediately jump into the top 12 of my dynasty running back rankings or anything like that. But he'll definitely be a top 20 guy. Yeah, definitely. We want to see him land well. Uh, and I think you bring up a, a, a good point about some of the the, the landing spots. Uh, for me, with Jonathan Brooks, I'm going to take a little bit of a cautious approach because I want to see the NFL teams actually do it. I want to see somebody take him at the end of the second round, take him in the early third round. And to me, that shows us that they're not worried about him recovering from this injury. But hey, you know, we're we're, we, we're all by all accounts, everybody in his camp uh, and all the tech people at Texas are saying he's going to be able to play you know, end of August. So he's going to be right there, like you said. Uh, and as long as he lands on on day two, I'm good. If right. we start seeing him fall into day three, then I start getting a little bit nervous. There gets to be a point where he would be a value in our rookie drafts, and I'd, I would take him regardless. But we would have a little bit less assurances. When we start talking about day two for these running backs, Heath, we saw, again, a lot of these running backs sign as free agents, and it sort of boxed out some of these spots that we wanted to see people land in. Certainly, Baltimore is off the table, and that was a spot where we were getting a little bit excited. Houston maybe still is is uh, you know a, a spot we would get excited about a rookie because they only paid a seventh rounder for Joe Mixon. Who are some of like the nuts landing spots where if a rookie lands in one of these places, it's wheels up for you? And you would be recommending dynasty managers to go and draft this player in their rookie drafts. Yeah, I think it's there's there's two that are obvious. I might be missing a third, but there's two that are obvious. And I'll just make the connection. It's become a drinking game on my show. So Blake Corum to the Chargers. And then, <laughs> no, but the Chargers are obviously for, are, are right at the top and the Cowboys are right with them. Like you get a rookie running back drafted on day two to one of those spots and I think that guy probably ends up in the first round of rookie drafts. Yeah, I, I think it's Dallas. It's the Los Angeles Chargers. And then there's a couple of other sneaky spots. Mm -hmm. Two places that I think would be very interesting, and I think the market would quickly move. The Cleveland Browns, based on Nick Chubb, the, you know, we don't know when he's going to be back. We don't know if he's ever going to return to that same form, and he's 28. James, and also I would say Arizona, because we have a direct path behind James Conner, who had a thousand rushing yards last year, but again is getting into up that like 28 year old level. And you brought them up earlier in the show when we discussed uh, we discussed the Las Vegas Raiders, right? But Zamir White is sitting there. If one of these appealing backs is selected by the Las Vegas Raiders in like the third round, like let's say the Raiders take Marshawn Lloyd, and you all of a sudden I think he would pass Zamir White in dynasty value relatively quickly. So there's still a number of spots that, that are very, very enticing. Definitely some that I didn't mention. I think the Los Angeles Rams as a direct handcuff to Kyron Williams, a guy that we don't have a whole lot of sample size if he can handle the volume year in, year out. Tampa Bay as a, as a direct handcuff to Rashad White. There's a few interesting spots, but certainly a lot less interesting spots than we, than we thought yesterday. So uh, and we've we've had this happen before too, where a guy gets drafted, gets a two or gets signed in free agency, gets a two year contract. We spend a month and a half projecting him as the RB one, and then the team goes and drafts somebody. So it wouldn't be that surprising. You mentioned Houston if they do that. Wouldn't be that surprising if the Giants draft a rookie to pair with Devin Singletary. Although maybe they won't want to pit, spend a, a high draft pick on a running back again. Um, but I think there's a couple of these places where we maybe have kind of ruled them out because they went and signed somebody, and they end up also drafting a running back as well. Good call on the Giants. The Giants need to add. You know, they need to add skill position players that can do something. That offense could be an absolute train wreck. 
Devin Singletary is a little bit sneaky right now. Uh, he could have been a guy that was a dirt cheap buy low, uh, but he didn't make our list. Why don't we dive right into it right now? The show is is called Dynasty Buy Lows. Heath and I are going to go through a few players each that we think could be trade targets for you immediately for your dynasty rosters. Uh, Heath, why don't you get us started? Uh, you have the list. Um, choose any of the ones you you put out there and and go ahead. Well, I'll choose the guy at the top of the list and the guy that you knew that I was going to put on the list, Javante Williams. I don't think we should hold last year's efficiency against him. He was coming off of an ACL. More often than not, running backs produce like Javante Williams did coming off the ACL more off, more than they do like Brees Hall did. So I still think there's an excellent opportunity in this Sean Payton offense for Williams to be a 55, 60% of the workload guy, which means a bunch of targets and a bunch of carries. I, he's still young enough that he can justify. I mentioned DeAndre Swift earlier in the show. He was at one point a consensus top five dynasty running back. Javante Williams was too, or at least top six. And so he's still a top 15 dynasty running back for me right now. That is considerably higher than where I see him in a lot of other people's rankings. I would be okay with giving up 111, 112 for Jonathan Williams. And I think that definitely gets it done. Javante Williams, I'll tell you a good Javante, and, and and Heath, it's a little running joke here because Javante Williams has been a Heath Cummings guy for a while. <laughs> uh, before I even spoke to Heath about this show, I just put him on the thumbnail because we, we I knew Heath would want to talk about him. But there was a time period where, you know, you talk about hi- him reaching uh, his sort of an apex of value. Heading into his second season, we had like a Dwayne McFarland said he's going to be a top five pick in redraft and the dynasty value shot up. It's, it would people assume that Melvin Gordon was on his way. He ends up coming back, but I had a short period of time where I sold Javante Williams for three first round picks in a single QB league. That's how enthusiastic the market is. The market right now for like Brees Hall and Jameer Gibbs, that's where it was for Javante Williams for like a two month period right after his rookie season. So I'm with you, Heath. I think Javante is an interesting player to buy. I also think Jaleel McLaughlin, even cheaper, is an right. interesting player to buy because I think Samaj P. Ryan could be on his way, just creating more touches for those guys. The offense loses Russell Wilson. I think it's going to be a little bit more run heavy. Uh, I love the way you started with that. And I'll say one player for me that's a little cheaper than than Javante, but just sitting there and very much like Javante Williams, this player survived the early portion of free agency, and that's Chuba Hubbard. Chuba Hubbard last year outplayed Miles Sanders. Chuba Hubbard ends up having a productive season in fantasy football, and now he gets Dave Canales as the head coach in Tampa Bay. Last year, Canales had Rashad White as a top eight targeted running back and a top five most carries at the running back position. Chuba Hubbard, of course, you're going to have to survive the NFL draft, but he already dodged a bunch of early free agency bullets. If he can survive day two of the NFL draft without like a Jalen Wright or a Blake Corum, or someone really appealing, then I think Chuba Hubbard has a chance to be a low-end RB2 based on volume in 2024. And this is the case for hope if you're someone with Ty J Spears or Khalil Herbert sitting on your roster. That free agent doesn't always take all the work that we think they were going to. No, I listen, I, I whiffed bad on Miles Sanders last year, but I was impressed with what Hubbard did. I do think Canales is going to have a running back that's very involved. I just think that if you if you buy Hubbard right now, and kind of like the same thing we were just talking about with, with Zamir White, like you've got to you're gonna get through that NFL draft with a whole lot of nerves. <laughs> And we don't have to, uh, yeah, it's those kind of backs. You're, you're just holding your breath. And right. It's, it's, it's a tilt. Um, you've got a quarterback on the list, Heath, and an interesting one. Yeah, it's Russell Wilson. And I was, I was probably more optimistic about Russell Wilson last year um, than most people were. I don't think Sean Payton did Russell Wilson a lot of favors, to be honest. I know everybody likes to kick Arthur Smith, but uh, he, Smith sat down with Wilson and then they made the choice to bring him in. I feel like they're going to do a better job designing that offense. George Pickens is a better wide receiver than Wilson had on the roster in, in Denver last year. And my favorite stat is, and I'll give the hat tip to Adam Azer here, Wilson had more touchdown passes last year than the Steelers have the last two years combined. This is an enormous upgrade for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And my full expectation, I know it's just a one-year vet minimum deal. My full expectation is that Russell Wilson is a starting NFL quarterback in 2025 on a multi-year contract. 
Say that stat one more time, Heath, because I think people should listen to that one. Russell Wilson had more touchdown passes last year from the Broncos in 15 games than the Pittsburgh Steelers have the last two seasons combined. That's wild, wild stuff, and he's dirt cheap. And my quarterback is just a little bit more expensive, but he's also younger. Mine is Baker Mayfield. And Baker Mayfield, despite finishing as a QB1 last season in Tampa uh, and gets rewarded with a big contract, Tampa Bay also brings back his preferred target in Mike Evans. Uh, it, Baker Mayfield, he hasn't really moved in terms of his dynasty valuation. This is a player that is going to continually be priced as a low-end QB2. People remember sort of like the Baker Mayfield is a joke type dynasty valuation. There's certain people that don't ever want to roster him again and certain people that want to ignore what he did last year. But Baker Mayfield played very well. Tampa Bay gave him rushing attempts. And again, the weapons are returning. It's going to be a similar offense despite losing Dave Canales. I think Baker Mayfield, you'll be able to get him for like a quarterback 24 price. And I think he's not going to, I would not bet on him to finish as a QB one once again, but I think, you know, that QB 15 to 18 range uh, based on the usage for him is very much in the wheelhouse. I think he's becoming sort yep. of the face of Tampa Bay's offense and the dynasty value is there for me. Another guy, like you're just choosing all of my pain points from the last two seasons because the Miles Sanders whiff and the DJ Moore with Baker Mayfield whiff. But yeah, I think I I would probably, I would rather, based on the cost difference, buy Wilson than Mayfield, but they're both good by lows. And you have a wide receiver who maybe you're getting a short buy window now because of his team situation. Yeah, Jordan Addison losing Kirk Cousins. But I will say, like, I thought he was kind of underpriced before we found out that Cousins wasn't going to be here. This was a first-round wide receiver who caught 10 touchdown passes last year, 900 receiving yards, and didn't really seem to gain value. In fact, he may have lost value. I feel pretty confident by the time we get to May and everybody's added these top three rookie wide receivers, he's probably he's going to be behind all three of them as well. Not sure that he's even going to be a consensus top 24 dynasty wide receiver. He's just right on that edge if you look at the Fantasy Pros dynasty consensus rankings. And I see several outs here. First off, we know this offense wants to be very pass heavy. They can go if they can get an adequate season out of Sam Darnold, or they happen to draft a rookie quarterback, then both Jefferson and Addison can both be successful because I don't expect a whole lot from TJ Hawkinson this year. Also, I'm not entirely certain they're going to be able to get Jefferson locked up. There's still a possibility that we're a year, maybe less than a year away from Jordan Addison just being the number one wide receiver on this offense. And I was glad to see last year during the period of time that Jefferson was out that Addison was able to fulfill those duties. If Justin Jefferson gets moved from Minnesota, I think my head will explode. It'll be the <laughs> biggest the biggest day ever on fantasy Twitter. Uh, and I can't even imagine the team that will be fortunate enough to get him. But I love what you're saying about Jordan Addison. It's so funny, Heath, because... It's a very short. It's a very short-sighted view for him right now in the dynasty community. Right, he's a player that we bet on last year. We used high rookie draft picks on, and he exceeded expectations. We certainly we projected him as a guy. I think the upside, uh, you know, projection was him, you know, being a Stephon Diggs-like player, and he flashed some of that ability last year with the big plays, the touchdowns. He certainly scored more touchdowns than anyone would have projected him for as a first-year player. Had more receiving touchdowns than Justin Jefferson in his rookie year. Uh, and Jordan Addison right now is getting beat up because we don't know who the Minnesota long-term quarterback is. You bring up Sam Darnold. The moment that Minnesota has a little bit of a long-term answer, whether it's they trade up and get a Drake May, whether they get a J.J. McCarthy with a slight move up, or maybe they end up with a Bo Nix or Michael Penix, just a uh, a, a replacement level, but at least we know who they are type player. Actually, I could probably convince myself to get a little bit excited about a Michael Penix with with Jefferson and Jordan Addison. But as soon as we have a little bit of clarity on the long-term future, that that window is closed to buy, buy Jordan Addison low. And you yep. bring up TJ Hawkinson, Hawkinson might miss half the season. So right. even if the offense takes a step back, that target share combined for Jefferson and Addison is going to be insane. And, and I wish we would have recorded this a few days ago because he just got traded. Uh, but he's still, I think, a little cheaper than what what you were going to have to give up, you know, uh, four games into the season, six games into the season. When it becomes apparent 
that Deontay Johnson is back to being a target magnet. We don't love the Carolina offense, but I do think they're going to have a little bit more of a clear path of what they're doing with Dave Canales in town. And Dave Canales has been sort of a quarterback whisperer. The Geno Smith ascent was under Dave Canales. The Baker Mayfield uh, dynasty recovery period was under Dave Canales. And then the player you referenced, Russell Wilson, had his best season ever with Dave Canales in Seattle as his quarterback's coach. So now Bryce Young gets Canales, and they go ahead and they trade for Deontay Johnson. Deontay Johnson took a huge step backwards last year. The situation was bad. Everything was was just not right in Pittsburgh for him last year. We're talking about a player who's still young, a player who is on a contract season, and a player who's had three years of 145-plus targets. He's had a 165-target season already in his career, and now he ends up on a Carolina team where I think Deontay Johnson being targeted 150 times next year is not out of the question. And the price you'd have to pay for him today versus one year ago is considerably less. Right. So I'm looking to kick, kick the tires and get that Carolina Panthers discount with Deontay Johnson uh, on, a, on a few fantasy teams of mine. Yeah, I, 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 it's a bit of a mixed bag, but I mostly think that the expectation should be that Bryce Young is going to be better than any quarterback that Deontay Johnson's had since Ben Roethlisberger. I projected Deontay Johnson, like not hoping for upside, but just projection, 144 targets next season. So yeah, there, there's absolutely room for him to jump right back into the top 25 dynasty wide receiver conversation. The only real concern slash risk I have is we had some character slash getting along with everybody concerns last year. And you mentioned it. It was a really bad situation. This situation in Carolina could go really sour. And if it does, and if he doesn't respond well, then the fact that he's in a contract year might be a huge negative because <laughs> there may not be a big market for him in, in, in this offseason. So I do think like this is a, a, a place where if you want to take a swing and there's a, there's a lot of room for upside, Deontay Johnson's a good guy to do it on. Certainly there's pressure on Deontay Johnson to perform for yep. the long-term contract that I know he wants to get. That can be a great motivator. I also think that getting away from Pittsburgh, you know, could be a, could be a good thing for him. It seems like like you brought up there was some some, you know, maybe some off the field stuff with the team where, you know, this sort of like dark cloud was above him and now there's a chance to, hey, we need you. This is Carolina. I think that there's a chance that it's Deontay Johnson with two rookies on the field a lot next year. Adam Thielen certainly should be back, um, but be Thielen's an older player. What we saw from Thielen last year is also indicative that Bryce Young can have tunnel vision for a guy. Yeah. Deontay Johnson has a lot more juice right now than Thielen, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm into him. Uh, you have a wide receiver here that is probably the most expensive player in Dynasty that we're going to talk about on this list. But still, you view him as a great value right now. Uh, yeah, Zay Flowers, and I I am curious to see. Like, I don't know how you value him and Addison, but the the stuff that I was looking at this morning and yesterday when I was kind of trying to come up with that list is they were kind of in the same situation. And Flowers, another guy who seems to have almost gone backwards in terms of value, despite what I thought was a pretty encouraging rookie season. I think he has an excellent chance not just to be the number one targeted wide receiver in Baltimore, but being the number one targeted player in Baltimore. And I, I feel like the efficiency was, if anything, a little bit unlucky last year. I would expect more production in terms of at what he does after the catch and a growing route tree. We kind of knew coming in that Flowers is going to have to develop a little bit in that area. So I still see an opportunity for him to be a team's number one wide receiver and option in the passing game for the next five plus years but also grow into that high-end wide receiver two range in terms of a dynasty evaluation. I'm seeing him valued more as a borderline number two, number three. So it, absolutely, unless somebody is already viewing him as a top 15 guy, I think there's a lot of room for growth. I, I actually really love this one, and it sort of opens my mind to things. But I think that what's funny is we have a recency bias as fantasy football managers and I think what's in a lot of people's head is Zay Flowers' fumble at the goal line, sort of right. how his season ends. And he and if he would have simply got in the end zone there, it would have been a massive 
massive fantasy performance for him in a game that really, really mattered for Baltimore. Uh, but now it's sort of like that's hanging over his head a little bit. But it was Todd Munkin's first year as coordinator in Baltimore, and we saw Zay Flowers break pretty much every Baltimore Ravens rookie record. The bar was not so high. I know some people are going to say, you know, he only had to break <laughs> like 850 yards, but still, he did it. And he became really the focal point of the offense when Mark Andrews went down. So I think it could be a little bit of a changing of the guard. I think a year from now, Zay Flowers is either going to retain the same value he has or gain dynasty right. value. I don't see him as a guy who could lose value. And with Jordan Addison, I'm I'm sort of on, on the same the same boat. Both of those guys were first round NFL picks. Both of those guys performed well as rookies. I I'm 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 not negative towards either. I think if you can get these guys, I would pay for Zay Flowers in a single QB league right now. I would offer the 106. I think the 105 is probably gets it done. Right. Um, and in a super flex league, the betting on a Brian Thomas Jr. versus or a Xavier Worthy or an Adonai Mitchell versus Zay Flowers, those are the kind of picks that you might want to offer. Where instead of having to worry about the landing spot and get something kind of new, you end up with with a player that at the very least, I think will be treated as a wide receiver two next year. Right. I think that's kind of where the market's at on Zay. I don't think it's in Fuego at all. Jordan Addison, I I, I don't I think you're I haven't seen too many, you know, buy low uh trades go down for him, but I do think that people are still kind of settling into the Sam Darnold situation in Minnesota. I right. did see Justin Jefferson put on one trade block in a big dynasty league that I'm in that, hey, I'd be willing to trade Justin Jefferson. So I think people are a little bit scared of this Minnesota situation. But I love that you bring up these two guys because I think a lot of times when people talk about dynasty by lows, they'll say, you know, go trade for Traylon Burks and Demario Douglas. And then it's like, okay, but I'm not really moving the needle for my for my dynasty roster right, right now. So I like that you're bringing those guys up. Uh, I'm I'm going to follow that one up with a player that is a little bit cheaper but a player that I think is a winner from the early stages of free agency, and that is Christian Kirk. Mm. This is a guy that I think is continually underrated in both redraft, best ball, and certainly in dynasty. We've seen him have 130-plus targets two seasons ago. He was on a great pace this year to start the year, gets injured. Calvin Ridley ends up leading Jacksonville in wide receiver targets. But Christian Kirk is not expensive. And I think he's a high-end wide receiver three this year. I think that if if Calvin Ridley ends up elsewhere, which I, I would put it at probably 50-50 right now, that he is not a Jacksonville Jaguar, unless he signed with somebody while we're recording here, which is entirely, <laughs> which is entirely possible. Uh, I usually have a million tabs open. For this one, I, I kind of kept it a little clean. But we apologize if he signed with somebody. But I'm going to go ahead and say Calvin Ridley is not a Jacksonville Jaguar. Right. The idea that they're going to have to give away that draft pick is going to limit the amount of money they're offering for him. Somebody like New England is going to sign Ridley. Christian Kirk is sort of locked into this 130 target role. And the Gabe Davis signing, Gabe Davis certainly can get those red zone targets that Calvin Ridley was receiving. I think Gabe Davis actually profiles well into sort of a quasi, you know, Ridley, Zay Jones type role where he's targeted the end zone targeted on deep balls, but he doesn't do anything to take away the target ceiling from Christian Kirk. And in fact, I think Christian Kirk has a higher target ceiling with opposite of Gabe Davis than he would have in sort of a de facto 1A, 1B with Ridley. So I think Kirk and also Evan Ingram both walk away as winners from the early uh, free agency period, provided Ridley is not a Jaguar. Yeah, it was basically a coin flip before Kirk got hurt, who was going to be better on a weekly basis, him or Calvin Ridley. And I think Kirk had actually scored more PPR fantasy points before the week before he got hurt than Ridley had. Now, some of that was because Ridley could not catch a pass with both feet inbounds. Um, but hopefully that won't be a problem again this year. I do think, like I said this last week, I, I think Gabe Davis makes everyone on Jacksonville's offense better. He helps Travis Etienne as a downfield blocker. He helps Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram because he can really stretch the field, which they really missed last year. And he helps Trevor Lawrence because he hasn't had a very good field stretcher. Yeah, and they've also improved their offensive line. I think the Jacksonville offense could be a little bit better. To, they, they took a step back based on what our expectations were for them last season. I think they could take a step forward in 2024. 
Uh, we have two players left. The chat is extremely lit. I told Heath I'd get him out of here in 45 minutes to an hour. We're well over an hour. We got two players left, but make sure you're subscribed to Player Profiler and smash the like button if you want more shows like this one. Heath, give us your last dynasty uh, by low candidate. It is Terry McLaurin. It seems like there's a little bit of fatigue on the Terry McLaurin's going to get a quarterback upgrade because we've heard before that Terry McLaurin's going to get a quarterback upgrade and it just hasn't turned into more fantasy points. When I looked over on Fantasy Pros, I think he was wide receiver 37 in the consensus dynasty rankings. I still have him as a top 30 dynasty wide receiver, and I still believe if he land if he gets a quarterback that can actually get him the football, he still has that top 15 wide receiver upside on a season-long basis. He's still in the middle of his prime, a little bit older than we'd like, but could have a good three-year run as a must-start number two wide receiver. He just needs the quarterback. I really like that one because I think he's dirt cheap right now. Right. And it's his quality of play last year was not bad at all, but it's sort of like the marketplace just doesn't care. He's a year older and has yet to have that season where – right. It's been so unfortunate for Terry McLaurin. There's like a, a sliding doors where he lands on a different franchise in Washington and he could have had a couple of wide receiver one seasons. Maybe Jaden Daniels gives Terry McLaurin another top 15 season or two. And this is a guy that's loved by his teammates in Washington. He's not a guy that I think Washington would ever really look to move on from at any point in the near future, especially with a rookie uh, quarterback. And you bring up Jahan Dotson. Uh, Jahan Dotson, you know, regressed a little bit last year right. and it looks like they're going to move on from Curtis Samuel. They signed Zach Ertz. So the only really clear wide receiver target is Terry McLaurin. Uh, and I, I like that one a lot. He's certainly cheap. I've seen a few people floating him on, on dynasty, uh, you know, message boards, uh, looking to, you know, potentially return some like second round picks for him. If you're a win now team, go ahead and trade for Terry McLaurin. I think he's cheaper than you think. And my last buy low candidate right now a guy that i think is actually cheaper than you would have had to pay last year certainly uh based on where you were taking him in rookie drafts is zach charbonnet mm -hmm. i think that the entire projection for the seattle offense with ryan grubbs running the show and mike Mc mcdonald as the head coach I i'm enthusiastic about where seattle's heading as a franchise charbonnet showed me enough last year that this is a player with some talent and he's a running back with size and receiving ability. And he played well in the games that Ken Walker was missing. I think that there's been sort of a, it's been sort of a revitalization of Ken Walker's dynasty value where this offseason people see Ken Walker as a guy who scored all these touchdowns in year one and year two. But touchdowns have been the big driver of Ken Walker's success, certainly last year. And I think this year could be with a new coaching staff Zach Charbonnet is going to have an opportunity to, again, cut into Ken Walker's usage. It could be a little bit more of a committee, and it could be Zach Charbonnet getting those important running back targets. And I think right now, last year, you would have had to use a first-round rookie pick in uh, a lot of like single QB leagues. This year, I think some people are looking for a Zach Charbonnet re-roll, and you might be able to trade like the 203, the yeah. 204 in a single QB league and people just take a shot at another running back, and you end up with a back that you've actually seen play uh, in an NFL team. And also, Keith, he's a guy that had top 50 draft capital last year. So the only thing holding down his dynasty value is the fact that he plays with another talented back. I like having talented players on my roster. I especially, I especially like betting on talented RB2s when you've had a coaching change. Because they could come in, I mean, the, the team basically has the same amount invested in these two guys. They could come in and see Charbonnet as the guy that they want to get those high-value touches. I thought going into last year that he was a better profile as a better both short yardage back and passing downs back. And so if he gets those two roles, it won't matter that Walker's handling a lot of the stuff between the 20s. Love that one. Yeah, and this was so much fun. Uh, th we, we gave you a bunch of Dynasty by low trade targets Heath, we got to talk about Jonathan Brooks, Malachi Corley, Jaden Daniels, some of your favorite rookies, and we got to discuss some free agency. You're incredibly generous with your time, as always. Let everybody know when they can find you, when your podcast drops. Uh, and anything you guys have coming out at CBS. Yeah, we record uh, FFT Dynasty on Tuesdays and Fridays at 11 a.m. Eastern. It's usually in the podcast feed within an hour after that. Uh, and you can find all of my content over at CBS Sports. You can find me on Twitter at Heath Cummings, SR.
yeah, make sure you're following Heath and checking out the work over at CBS. Check out press coverage yesterday. I recorded with Alan Soslowski, Sonic Truth Dynasty podcast with Alan and Cody Carpenter, a Car- Carpentier, excuse me, on Monday. And then if you want to dive a little bit more into this free agency class on Stack Hunters this evening, Bradley Stalder and Dan Williamson have Jim Coventry from Rotowire on. They're going to dive deep into this free agency and hopefully a couple more signings today. Stick with us here at Dynasty Life. We got you covered all throughout your Dynasty offseason, heading into your rookie drafts. Have a great rest of your day. From the pod father to you, I deeply appreciate you tuning in. And many ask, what can I do? What can I do to help support the host, the research they do, the production costs? Go to playerprofile.com, Dynasty Deluxe, World Famous Draft Kit, Rankings, DFS Dominator, and of course, Data Analysis. Subscribe to any one of those, and you support all of us, and take Player Profiler to the moon.